Yeah, I, re I remind you that here you can find the lecture notes and uh, here are uh, the recording of the videos. I've also uploaded uh, somehow uh, an extended version of the first part, which ends today uh, for me. So the plan was uh, for the first part to, to start uh, discussing quantum mechanics and then try to motivate Euclidean quantum field theory. And uh, um i won't i will try to end actually i will end this this morning and then uh, start to discuss the second part which is uh, really stochastic quantization okay once we have defined our problem and somehow we have understood uh, the constraints we have and uh, what we really want so how what is uh, Euclidean quantum field theory and what we really want to construct then we start to see this um, technique of stochastic quantization okay, more in detail. Okay. And uh, yeah, today I will look mostly in, in a discrete setting, trying to address, uh, so there will be two limits and somehow the techniques are different for the two limits. And today I will try to address the first part that is the infinite volume limit. And uh, next week we'll discuss the limit of very small scales, which introduce renormalization problem, and uh, and then putting all together. Okay, but uh, okay, let's start from the simplest setting. Okay, this is just the, you see here, what you see here is just the old lecture, nothing new because I just copied the, the script and use, using, I'm using that script. Yeah, I'm sorry, the, there is some, work going on on top of my head so i hope that the noise does not um, create a problem for our lecture let me know if if the noise is too large for okay at some point they yesterday they started drilling and they really was not really pleasant anyway um outside it's very cold so i, I don't want to, to give a lecture outside um Okay, just to make the point and uh, go back, uh, refresh your mind of what was the last thing we did. And then we were discussing perturbation of ref uh, reflection positive process. Okay, we had a process P and then we constructed a new process Q, which was reflection positive for two, essentially in two, you, you can see this in two different ways, or you can construct such kind of perturbation in two different ways. Either you do this kind of Gibson perturbation, which has this structure taught so that you, you can really prove very easily reflection positivity. And, uh, or we looked at a Markovian setting, okay? It will not go very, I, I'm going very fast on that. And then, I motivated the uh, Euclidean quantum field theory discussing the structure of uh, Minkowski space time and how locality is important and how this impose us to look at fields that is a observable experiment which are localized in space and time. So you, you can measure a quantity in each space time point and we restrict you know, the lecture just to scalar quantity. So you can measure only one real valued quantity in each space time point and then you you impose uh, certain properties and somehow one major point uh, of, of the discussion was somehow that this fixes somehow the what is an Euclidean quantum field theory okay uh, the probability measure um, in this lecture, okay, you, you can understand more broadly, okay, there are Euclidean quantum field theory which cannot be represented as probability measure. But let's say in the context of this talk and for, for what I will discuss, I will only concentrate only to in one example of a, pro, of a Euclidean quantum field theory which corresponds to a probability measure. Uh, and this probability measure is the law of a random distribution over RD. Okay, and it has to have at least these two property, uh, reflection positivity and Euclidean invariance, okay, plus other maybe regularity assumption. But I, I think structural property are more important uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned here. And then we, we discussed it a bit. Um, so recall for, okay, uh, so, re, okay, yeah, let me. What we discussed, okay, we discussed, okay, let's take uh, a bunch of uh, 
of Orste Uhlenbeck processes and let's try to make out of them a, a Euclidean covariant process. And then we realize quite quite fast that somehow the only way seems to be, and that, that's actually the case. So it, it seems to be that, or of course you can take linear combination of these kind of things. For example, you can take this this parameter which are fixed to be random okay this will be useful especially if you want to consider a larger class of processes so do, you don't have to imagine that the covariance has to be like this you could for example take this parameter random and uh, and average over different values of this parameter that is take linear combination of independent or Uhlenberg process with different mass that's also reflection invariant but let's concentrate on that, okay? That, that would not add anything more unless the mass is going to zero. In that case, you can construct more complicated processes. But that's the easiest, okay? You cannot have easier than that. In particular, we saw that we start to see some problems, okay? We start to see the fact that this process, which a priori depends on space and time, it's Gaussian process space and time. So you would like to think of it as a function of space and time, random. Uh, it, it is not, okay? So the variance, if you look at the point, the variance is plus infinity, okay? So it cannot be a function. Uh, of course, okay, something has to be wrong in, in all these arguments. The argument is that you, maybe you cannot evaluate in zero, okay? Of course, as soon as you smear with a test function, that's fine, but you, you cannot just compute the field in a, in a given point. Okay, I will maybe discuss. So this is the ultraviolet, what is called the ultraviolet problem. It's linked to the fact that somehow this field is too irregular to be really a function. It's a distribution in the in the in the in the Euclidean variables, let's say. Um, but anyway, okay, and then I just noted uh, on the way that somehow this Gaussian process, it's its solution of an SD. I will use it again today, but uh, that's not the SD we, we will use uh, later on, okay? Um, okay, so we arrived at this point, so I can take everything and just uh, cancel because we will start from scratch today. And I want, so the new section, um, or maybe a subsection most appropriately uh, will be, so I, I will try to motivate, okay, how, so we saw an example, so, okay, so how we do interact in quantum field, okay, we saw last, last time, um, we saw the example of the uh, Gaussian free field, okay, free field, which is the Euclidean quantum field theory with cover, uh, the Gaussian, okay? And when I say Euclidean quantum field theory in this le lecture, I really mean just uh, a reflection positive and Euclidean. Okay, it's a, it's a measure on distribution with two stup property, okay? and. Uh, uh, so let, let me let me start to change names because I will use X for another thing uh, from today on. Um, and uh, let me just denote the Gaussian free field in this way. Okay, so you have to imagine it's a random distribution scalar. Okay, it's a um, it's a random distribution. And now I'm I'm you see I'm working with Euclidean time, okay, in Euclidean variables, okay, and then you, you define this, uh, a different point, this makes sense, is okay, I, unless you complain too much, I will be a bit sloppy about, uh, but uh, because somehow it's not, we understood that it's not a function, okay, so uh, you can question me why you compute at a given point, but somehow a different point, this quantity, it's okay, and then you have to imagine that you you can smooth out with the test functions, okay? So I, I could write it more precisely um, as a distribution, okay? You, you have to think that the, the covariance is a, is a distribution. And then uh, of course this covariance does, okay? Which makes sense. So 
as one looks at phi of phi, uh, which is the integral instead, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you okay, let, let me define, uh, okay, this formula. Okay, let me make this point now, okay, does. Okay, I, I will go back, uh, now let me go back at, at the, maybe next week, I will discuss more uh, appropriately all this. Let's say at this point, I will discuss just informally because I will want to switch away from this problem uh, for today. So we understood that there is a problem in this formula. Okay, you, this cannot be, phi of x cannot be a, a Gaussian drop variable because its variance is plus infinity, okay? Uh, and so let me say understood, and I will go back to this point next week. Understood in the sense of distribution. A distribution of sense. Ah, distribution of sense. More details. Next week. Okay. I, I don't want really to enter into this point right now, unless you start to complain because you don't understand. If you don't understand, please complain and I will try to be more precise to just address your uh, maybe confusion. But for the moment, we don't need uh, more than that. So this was one example. So what about uh, non-Gaussian examples? And uh, we can try the perturbation approach of the last lectures, okay? Uh, we already understood, we know already that the perturbation, okay, that if I call, I call mu, mu the law of the Gaussian free field, let me, so Gaussian free field, I will, uh, then I should write something, uh, I, sh I can introduce a new measure. I hope <laughs> to be able to introduce a new measure as follows, a new reflection positive measure as follows. Okay, so, um, so I will start to use like the notation. So we understood, okay, we need to make a perturbation. Okay, in time. So this is the Euclidean time. So remember, I forgot about the difference be between the time and space variable, but somehow imagine that one of these coordinates is still the time. So surely I can reproduce the formulas from the last week by saying, Okay, I can, I need to use one of the coordinates time. And then somehow the others I keep implicit and I have a function of this section of my random field. Let's forget for the moment that this random field does not exist. Okay, but uh, that will be another problem. Let's imagine I can compute at a point so I can compute in a section and I compute this potential and surely I can do this, okay? where x0 is just, is the Euclidean term. Okay, let, let's call it x, it depends on how you want to call the coordinate, maybe let's call it x1, okay? Where x1 in R is the Euclidean term. I will need to introduce another time later on. So I, I want for, for the moment in this, from le this lecture on the Euclidean time will not play any role. So it will be just another Euclidean coordinate. So I call it x1 because it's not different from x2 or x3 in this approach. And actually the fact they are not different, it's important in the reconstruction because it will give you back the Poincare invariance of, of the quantum theory, okay? So the, the reflection, you, you see reflection positivity and Euclidean invariance, you, you can do reflection positivity with respect to an axe, but then when you have Euclidean invariance, you can do with respect to any other axis, okay? And Together, this tells you that there is a, a Poincare invariance in the quantum theory. That is, even if you construct your theory, you see at some point we have to, in the reconstruction we explained, we have to choose a scalar product, okay? In order to choose a scalar product, you need to introduce a reflection axis 
you have to decide in which direction you want to construct your reflections, okay? And this allows you to construct an inverse space. So at this level, you break the point, you, you break the symmetry of the problem, okay? Because you choose a direction. But then somehow the construction carry on, the, the, the remaining symmetry remains in the construction, then becomes the Poincare invariance of the, the new Hilbert space, okay? And the new operator. So just, I want to mention that there is a subtle point which is very important for, for the reconstruction in the Poincare invariant, equivalent setting, let's say. However, here we don't care. We just, we have to single out, let's say I want to do reflection positivity with respect an axis. Uh, so I single out one coordinate, let's say the first one, and I try to do this kind of perturbation. Then you realize very, very early, okay, uh, that, uh, but in this way, I completely break, okay, the Euclidean invariants, okay? So I need a, a more symmetric way to introduce the perturbation. And so now you need a way in which it looks like this in every coordinate, okay? Which looks like the above, but in each coordinate, okay? And then the, let, let me call it L because, okay, <laughs> because it will not, yeah, time will be, I, I told you it will be another thing later, okay. Um, and, uh, okay, and therefore one is led to consider the, uh, sorry, here the perturbation I didn't wrote properly, okay, it's the perturbation of the measure mu and you write with respect to the next, or maybe let me write more appropriately so it's clear that phi is like the canonical variable. Okay, I can write in this way. And maybe you need a, a normalization constant, okay. Now, uh, if you want, if you want, uh, uh, and here, here V, what is V? Well, V is a function which go, let's say from the fields in one variable. I don't know exactly how to write them, but let's say, um, R, okay, let me write in this way into R. Okay, so these are like all the maps in one variable and goes to R, okay, very, very. But of course, if you want this expression to look the same in every coordinate, then you don't have much choice, okay? You need somehow to have an integral in every coordinate and you need uh, to have something which somehow when you use Fubini, you, looks like this. And so at the end of the day, you see that more or less the only choice you have, I think, is that you think one can even prove it, but... Uh, Okay, it has to be a, a Lebesgue integral in every direction. Okay, so it, it has to be a local function time uh, a Lebesgue, uh, time something which is, yeah, local function integrated in space. Okay, where now uh, V is just a function from R to R. Okay. Okay, so this expression is the property I wanted. Okay, it, like, it looks like this in every, let's call it V prime, okay, because it's not, or maybe V tilde, because I would not, uh, so this is now as this property, okay, so I hope you agree with me that in every coordinate looks like this, and what is V tilde is the integral in the other coordinate, okay, this has the above form, form above in every coordinate, of course, we broke the uh, translation invariants. So le let me give a name to this, let's call it mu L, because it depends on L, and also rotation invariants, okay? Since the integration domain has no, has no such symmetries, okay? has no such symmetries. So you, you see the problem, okay? It's clear that we cannot take. So 
So integration domain, this is lambda. We cannot take lambda equal rd. Okay, you would like to take this because that's the only somehow integration domain which is translation and rotation invariant, okay? Of course, you could take a, a circle, would be rotation invariant, but then will not be translation invariant, okay? Because otherwise, the above expression uh, does not make sense anymore. Okay, so you have a bit constraining here. Uh, again, okay, still, uh, moreover, we still have the problem that uh, phi of x really does not make sense. Uh, indeed, we will see that phi of x is only, uh, phi is only a random distribution. So a random element or the, let's say you, you can take the Schwartz space. Okay, it's, uh, it's temperate, but uh, uh, it's not certainly a function. Okay. And actually, if you want, maybe you already know, you, you can guess from this expression that uh, as the dimension get larger here, the problem get more serious. Okay, and this is a sign that uh, um, it's regularity degrades with the space dimension. Okay. Uh, okay, is, is um, okay, unless, uh, of course, you have a situation where it makes sense, okay, in dimension one. Uh, for all, so in dimension one, it makes sense, okay, that's clear. In dimension, but we already know the theory in dimension one, okay, we already solved it, so, we are really interested for the bigger record than two. Okay, and so we, we have a problem even not only in the evaluation, but we have a problem to give a meaning. What does it mean to compute a nonlinear function of a distribution? Okay, we will also have the problem of understanding what is V of V a nonlinear function of a distribution. Okay, so we have a, we have a lot of problems. So let me, let me single out this problem. So we have this, this, uh, and we have this problem. Okay, we have a lot of problem in this approach, but somehow it's the only approach uh, is, is the way we are going to pursue, pursue let's say. So, of course, uh, this expression does not still make sense, okay? And uh, in order to make, uh, so in order to make this well-defined, so let me see if I give a name. Yeah, okay, this is like, uh, let's give a name because, uh, so I call this, uh, keep me measure naive. So in order to give a meaning to, that equation. Um, yeah, we can regularize. So th this is the standard procedure now. So now, but this motivates why you need it, okay? You are constrained by reflection positivity and Euclidean invariance to have an expression which looks like this and which has Gaussian free field here. Um, and then these two things does not work together, okay? If the Gaussian free field is not regular and this expression want to look at the field at a given point, okay? And unless you do this, you will not have many chance to get reflection positivity at the end of the day and Euclidean invariance, okay? So in order to give a meaning to one, we can regularize uh, the expression. Uh, th that's one possible way, okay? by smoothing out phi. 
okay? So that's one possible way. Okay, just uh, we choose a smooth function rho from Rd to R, let's say compactly supported, maybe. Okay. Um, and such that uh, if you consider now you you just rescale it and uh, like the rights rescaling now i have to get the rescaling rights so let me see uh, yeah. so you want it to to converge to the delta function in the sense of distributions so that um that letting Uh, we have, uh, we can define, now you you define the smoothed field, okay, you define a new field which in any point is just the old field, integrated, okay, let me write, uh, there are many, okay, still, okay, let me just write this expression, okay, and then you, this expression, so now it's well defined, okay, which is now a well defined. Gaussian field with covariance. So now let's just to make an exercise. Okay, so how is the covariance of this Gaussian field? Uh, okay, it's even smooth Gaussian field okay, with covariance. Um, so what is its covariance? Well, you, you have done a convolution, so uh, in Fourier transform is just a product and so you will get something like this you will get the Fourier transform of rho and then you think a bit and you will have if I did the computation right you will have epsilon k square here okay and th this is nice because uh, this expression is going to zero very fast okay because somehow you take a very smooth function um Okay, which is now, now given uh, by a convergent integral sense. Uh, hat rho, the Fourier transform rho. Uh, has a rapid decay. Okay, so we are in, in good shape. Actually, this is a smooth function. Well, completely. So now we can define V of V epsilon X and also a measure, new measure. Uh, let me just take this one. So what is the new measure? Well, the new measure is uh, L epsilon. Yeah, let me... Let me check what I want in the future. But now all the problem is to choose the right. Uh, I think I want to send epsilon. Yeah, I don't care very much. Okay, let's now everything depends also on epsilon because you regularize the field. Okay, that's one possibility. Okay, so this is uh, reg one. Let's say. Okay, this, this is not the po this is a possible approach. Uh, but this pro uh, so this approach is okay for getting some results but is not the one we will use the main problem for me is that um, so uh, one of the problem is that this measure is not anymore reflection positive, okay? Because somehow you, you gave up, uh, you, you take this smoothing and then you try to redo the proof of reflection positivity, it does not work, okay? If you split the integral at zero, somehow this function is looking a bit in the negative axis, okay? So think, why? Okay. Exercise. So uh, at least I cannot say in general, okay? It's not obvious that it's reflection positive and uh, I don't think it's reflection positive, okay? And so my reflection positivity, either you, 
you have an easy way to prove it or it's not uh, it's not feasible okay uh, apart from the two strategies i showed you i don't know other strategies to prove uh, reflection probability okay so either you prove that it's markovian or you prove that uh, somehow you can do that computation that i show you and here you cannot do neither of the two okay as soon as you smooth in every direction uh you are lost okay you're not markovian anymore and you you can you you cannot uh, okay uh there is a solution somehow in this approach one can still uh, arrange to smooth only uh d minus one directions And uh, in many situations, it's okay because this, when you smooth in d minus one direction, somehow you, you just uh, kill d minus one of these integrals. And the last one, it's okay because uh, it's, then it's like one dimension, okay? Um, and use reflection positivity in the remaining direction, okay? That's a possible approach. Uh, this would be fine even if not uh okay this will be fine okay um uh okay so that, that's uh, that's another way okay uh, to do you can smooth in d minus one direction and that's also fine you you lose a bit of regularity but i uh, think one can manage that but still this is not uh, uh for in the rest uh, of these lectures. Uh, in the most part, okay, in the, I would uh, I, I rather use another approach, which also preserve, which preserves both uh, uh, reflection positivity and the Euclidean invariance or at least good approximation of them okay what i mean so what i will do sorry I lost my notes so what i want to do is just introduce a third approach where you can get things uh, um done bet easily uh yeah okay and uh the third approach is as follows. Um, um, so, so the, let me explain what is the issue. The issue is that um, we will take weak limits of this family of measures. Okay, we will. That's. That's the idea, okay? That's the goal we want to have. Um, as soon as you take weak limits um, and you don't have uniqueness, then you can have more than one limit point, limit point okay? And uh, as soon as you don't have very strong control in this limiting procedure and you don't have any, the property which uh, you have some property in valid on the sequence, then you, you it's difficult to prove in the limit because somehow you don't have very much control of the limit. So for example, here we break Euclidean invariance and we break reflection positivity. And then one would like to take the limits and then prove that the limit is reflection invariant and uh, um, Euclidean uh, invariant, okay? But then since you don't know very well the limit, uh, it's difficult to prove it in the limit, okay? Uh, and you certainly, you don't have it at the, at the level of the approximation, okay? So usually the, the good way is that as soon as you can, you, you want to preserve your symmetries in the approximation because then they pass to the limit, okay? That's also the reason why uh, reflection positivity has been an historically an important property and is still an important property because you, you can, it's easy to pass to the limit if you have it before in the approximation, okay? So we want the approximation which try to maintain as much possible reflection positivity on linear invariance. You, you cannot precisely, but you can get a good approximation, okay? Um, 
and uh, so this way is, is pro we proceed as follows. So this will be somehow the setting uh, in the rest of the lecture. We we fix a small parameter and a large parameter. Let's take them the addict because it's easier than to reason. Okay, one will go to zero and one will go to infinity, and then you take. Uh, lattice so you take a, a square lattice uh, of size epsilon so this would be like approximation of the continuous space okay and you you take just a box in this in this lattice okay so now you, you are in a finite situation okay this is a finite set and it contains like m divided by epsilon plus one points okay which is this is an integer because i choose the things in the right way and then you, you think somehow periodic an approximation on the full space in the sense that you take this set and what happens outside, you just think of copy, periodic copy of what's going on in this in this box, okay? Or just take it uh, with periodic boundary condition, okay? In, yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so that, that's the situation. Let me fix some notation, uh, okay, so that, that's the set, okay? Let me fix some notations. Uh, we are going to discretize the problem. Our problem uh, on this domain, okay? So that instead of taking the continuum cube, I take this, uh, Okay, replace, uh, okay, minus L, L, D with lambda, epsilon M, and I use the same, yeah, okay. Uh, I will discuss the literature later. Let me finish this part. I, I, I'm changing the name of the parameter just because uh, I want to stick to the notation in, in the paper I use as the main reference. Uh, at this point, uh, uh, some useful notation which will follow us in the in the following. So one has to recall how to do Fourier transform. Okay, it thinks uh, in, in the full space Fourier transform is just an integral over essentially the the same space because the dual group of uh, R D is R D. Um, but in now we are in a discrete uh, group, a billion group, and one has to be more careful because that will be important later on. Not really today, but like uh, in the next week, yes. Uh, so the Fourier transform, now I have two situations. I have the first situation where I look at the discrete full lattice, and uh, then I have a situation where I look at the lattice uh, at a finite box, okay, in the full lattice, um, the Fourier transform of a function, it's just uh, somehow like the integral, but you approximate the integral with the, with the Riemann sum, okay? And the, you, you have this, this is the volume of the elementary cell. And then the dual, uh, so the inverse Fourier transform is an integral, it's still an integral because the lattice is infinite, but it's an integral in a compact region. And I put the two pi here because uh, I don't want to have them around uh, here, okay? I, I always get it wrong. But I would not be very much consistent, okay? So there will be two pi around uh, lost in the nature, which, uh, okay, you have to pay attention. Um, okay, so, and then what happens if you take a finite lattice, okay? Uh, maybe here I got it wrong, this is M, oh, sorry, uh, yeah. So now the dual, it's, uh, you, you see the, the, the role of M and, and epsilon change. So now it's a new lattice, uh, which is sp with the spacing of size one over M and of size uh, epsilon minus one. And uh, okay, so uh, the dual of a, finite, uh, of a finite group is another finite group, but uh, you somehow the parameter get exchanged. What is, what is small is large and what is large is small. Okay. It's the same group, but the two parameters are exchanged. Okay, this is similarly, this is exactly uh, lambda uh, m minus one epsilon minus one. Okay, just, uh, okay, with maybe a 
actually, I think it's exactly equal with my. Okay, I, yeah, the, the uh, okay, then maybe I got it wrong here. Let me think if it's epsilon. I think it's epsilon over two. Otherwise, the size, the number of points has to be the same. Um, I'm, I am correct. Uh, yeah, I think it's okay. So I think it should be divided by two because you need to have the, the same number of points. Okay, for the transforming finite uh, dimension, it's by operation. So you have the same number of degrees of freedom. Uh, ah, yeah, no, I got it wrong. Okay, now I'm, because you have also complex, so maybe there is a two around which is missing. Um, no, I think it's like this, you you have, okay, now I'm, no, I think it's, like this. sorry. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I, I leave you leave you to the side. It's not very important for, for what I'm doing, okay? We will not solve our problems. But okay, just pay attention to these to these things. Otherwise, at some point we got lost. Um, okay, this is just notation, and now I approximate the measure. Um, yeah, let, let me. So I approximate. So now I have a new measure, mu epsilon, and maybe m. And you take, okay, here I still continue to use, okay, let me use this new notation I introduced. So now the Gaussian free field will be discrete, defined on the discrete space and on the discrete box, okay? Uh, of course, if I don't put M, it's just all the space, okay? Uh, and you define it as more or less as you have here, Okay, so what is this? Well, well, you think a moment that this is like the symbol of the, the Laplacian, so you should have uh, something like this, okay, the inverse of the discrete Laplacian. Uh, if you don't understand or if you feel puzzled, just stop me, okay? So now at, the mo at this moment, these are like a large matrix, and what is this matrix? This is the inverse of the matrix given by this formula. Okay, so this is uh, the discrete Laplacian with periodic boundary condition. So actually should depend also, uh, should depend also on M because somehow you, you imagine that you put a boundary condition. Yeah, I don't, okay, I didn't want to introduce all the notation, okay. And uh, yeah, okay, let, let me, um, yeah, okay, let me write in this way. Uh, I will need, uh, okay, how does it look like? Why Why I say this is a good approximation? Well, here you have to do some computation. Uh, I do it now because anyway, I will have to do at some point, uh, at some point, okay? So um, uh, let, let's, at some point, I will have to justify that this really converts to something which looks like that. Okay, so let's, uh, maybe you, you believe, but let's uh, give a look at the moment. Okay. Uh, okay, just for notation, let's introduce discrete derivatives. And uh, yeah, the only difference, uh, let, let not me, let me be a, a bit, because I don't want to have this M going around all the times, okay? Uh, a pre, okay, the, the Laplacian, you see the expression depend only on epsilon, but of course depend also on M because it's the domain where it's, you define it, okay? And also for the discrete derivatives, but uh, let me skip. Unless you feel confused, uh, please ask question. I, I will not introduce them in the notation, okay? Because somehow it's the same in the full space, just the set of function. It's periodic instead of being a function without periodicity. And then you compute the, how the derivative looks like. So you have two kinds of derivative, either you go forward or you have to do it backwards. Uh, you imagine these are divided by epsilon because the, the lattice pi of epsilon, okay? I want this to be approximation of a continuous derivative if the function f is defined everywhere. And, uh, and then you look, how does it look like in Fourier transform? And then you compute a formula for that. And you, you try to compute the Laplacian. The Laplacian, it's really, you can check the Laplacian. It's really 
the sum of the derivative and this minus derivative, which is like minus the joint of the, did it, uh, yeah, I think, I, no, I think I, I did it wrong. So yeah, uh, I think it's correct now. No, I think it's correct now, yeah. Uh, ah, I'm, I'm lost, but it's correct. Okay, le let me check. Uh, if I did it computation right, this, okay, you compute this and you have this very nice expression. Why I call it nice? Because you see that as epsilon is going to zero, this is like ki squared with some two pi around, but that's not, uh, let's not bother too much about the two pi. And now you have a minus, so this is negative. Uh, so you see that this is a negative uh, operator. Did I got it right? Yeah, so the Laplacian is this negative operator. I think it's okay, good. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to be sure that everything is fine. And I think maybe here, just for clarity, I write on two lines. Uh, okay, and then just to have a final formula. Uh, so I define the covariance in this way. What, what is this? Well, you, you just use Fourier transform, okay? To define the, this object is just the inverse of this operator. It's a matrix in this case, okay? But it has this form, maybe there is no two pi here actually. Uh, because uh, the way I normalize the, 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 the Fourier transform. <clears throat> should be like this, if I didn't get it wrong. And you see that it's positive and this is an approximation. So let me just uh, write it. You, you see, this is more or less an approximation of k squared plus m squared. So we, are, sh we should be on right as O as epsilon is going to zero, okay? And this is an approximation of the integral as epsilon is going to zero. Um, yeah. Okay, this is uh, the, an approximation of, all right, this is an approximation of the integral. First of all, yeah, integral on Rd, okay, as epsilon is going to zero. So we are, uh, we are, we have what we want, okay, that's, that's why I claim this is an approximation of my Gaussian free field, okay. So, um, phi epsilon, where I put the index, sorry. Epsilon m is an approximation Gaussian free field of here. Okay, actually, you, you can prove it converging low in certain spaces. Okay, because somehow the covariance is converging when you, you test it on nice functions. Um, okay, then we have in a we are in a good position because now I define. Uh, so now the point is that I want to define um, this measure. So this is a measure on, okay, now let me not bring, uh, okay, I define it in this way. Yeah. So this is the measure and then you, you integrate this function, okay? Now you replace the integral with a sum. You have this function, which is very, this measure, it's very nice. And you have a function bounded below, okay? Note that uh, phi epsilon uh, with a note. Mu epsilon m, it, it's low. Note that it is a low. On, uh, on R to the power lambda epsilon M, okay, which is a finite dimensional space, okay. Uh, one can also, by a boost of notation, I will, uh, I will also consider it as a measure on uh, R lambda epsilon, okay? So you, you can consider it as a measure on R lambda epsilon by periodic extension, okay? 
you can always okay you, you have something a periodic function on a on a box and then you extend periodically in the full space and then you can consider this is a measure okay this measure also live in the foot space it still depend on m but you you can make it live on the foot space and that's easy uh, useful when you want to take limits so there is a question we use m at the beginning not l right yes where i put an l oh yeah Thanks, Luca. Uh, I think I might not, yeah, at some point I changed my mind, but it was not consistent. Okay, I think now it's fine. But okay, okay, note that, uh, okay, so uh, the measure. On, again, okay, you, you can define this measure on the space or by extension on Again, okay, the, there is no difficulty. I think conceptually sometimes it's useful to consider it as a, something on the foot space, especially when we want to change M and somehow the probability space has to, is constant. Okay, uh, this for uh, this approximation uh, now preserve is elementary. I, I want to just stress that that's elementary now, okay? You, there is nothing difficult. I mean, you have a Gaussian process in a finite dimensional space. I could even write down the density, but it would not help me in any way. Um, and then this density is a sum. You have things, uh, you have functions of the field. The field is well-defined in every point of the lattice. Everything is fine, okay? And it has the advantage uh, yeah, I have a question I will answer later. Uh, let me finish here, uh, that it preserves, what it preserves, okay? It preserves Euclidean uh, discrete translation variance with respect to the lattice lambda epsilon, okay? And moreover, uh, reflection positivity, a discrete version of reflection. Po reflection positivity in the discrete setting is easy to understand what it is, okay? Just, uh, uh, there is some subtlety with zero, okay? What you do with zero, okay? You, because reflection positivity, you have to associate to things, so you don't know what to do with zero. So you have to be careful how you define it, but uh, otherwise that's fine. And uh, I will not insist too much right now. Maybe I will go back to this when I, I need to prove the full refle this, uh, um, reflection positivity. For the moment, let's just uh, keep it as this. So Z in the FT. So, ah, okay, yeah. Okay, certainly there is uh, M here. So Z divided by L in the Fourier transform. Yeah, okay, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so for, for more, if you're interested and you are impatient to, to let me see if I have, uh, what is? Okay, yeah, for the impatient, they can look at, um, if you want to see the detail, how you implement this discrete for a, uh, the discrete reflection positivity, you can check um, uh, reference for uh, discrete reflection positivity. Is this book of uh, Friedli and Jan Velenik, which is quite nice and elementary and uh, it has uh, it has some it has application also okay in the discrete setting is very useful allow you to prove a result on the infinite volume limit in a quite elegant way it's a very powerful tool uh, reflection positivity okay and so now uh, which so both these properties uh, so both our discrete versions of uh, translation invariance and reflection positivity will converge nicely 
to their continuum counterpart as epsilon go to zero and m go to plus infinity. Okay. So you need to take both limits somehow because the reflection positivity, you really want to have reflection of a full semi-space into another, okay? So if you keep, if you, a discrete and periodic, yeah, these functions are periodic, okay? So when you reflect, you, you have to understand what you're doing. Uh, you, you cannot reflect very easily, okay? You are reflecting on a circle. And of course, the circle has two sides, so you have to reflect one side on the other, okay? But no, that's not the same thing as reflecting on the full line, especially you have to understand exactly what you do in the antipodal points. So let's not discuss this right now, okay? That's not the point of these selections. But that is a constraint we have. So now that's why, we, did, for example, we want to work with this because we have this discrete and periodic version of translation invariance and reflection positivity. And we have to take epsilon to zero because we don't want discrete. And so now we have to take m to zero, okay? To get rid, to get rid of discreteness and m to infinity to get rid of periodicity. Otherwise you don't get the full Euclidean group and the full reflection positivity that we introduced, okay? The, this will be other models, okay? If you don't, if you want to describe, so it will be a strange model if you don't get rid of periodicity because time will be periodic when you go back to the quantum model. Okay? I am not even sure what, what does it mean. So that, that's somehow the kind of uh, constraints you have. So let, let me let me put a triangle here because that's an important point. And let me put a triangle where I define the measure. That's also an important point. Okay. So here we are uh, after the first hour, and now we are at the point where we can start to discuss stochastic quantization. Okay. So this ends the first part, and. Uh, um, Sorry, uh, I don't want to. What happens? I did uh, did something wrong here. There is something. At some point, I just uh, made a mistake. I don't, I'm not sure where I, why. And okay, let, let's say um, that's an important point. Okay, so let's keep it. Okay, so this, um, that, that's end the first part. Okay, so I, with, with this discussion, I conclude completely uh, uh, the discussion of the link between quantum mechanic and, and the Euclidean quantum field theory. Okay, so, so this ends the first part. Uh, we will now discuss uh, the passage quantum mechanic to Euclidean quantum field theory and the formulation of our main problem. Okay. So the main problem is how to control this limit. Okay. So the rest of the course is how, okay, the rest of the lecture will concern the uh, analysis of these, these measures in order to get, to prove the existence of the limits above. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the point. Okay, so we conclude that was the first part, essentially motivations. Uh, I found, I think it was important to give it so now I learned it because nobody explained to me before, at least. Uh, and so I, I, I always somehow started from the problem, but I, I, I never really seriously thought about um, 
why we write this problem. Okay, then you can give many motivations, but I think as, if you want to come from quantum mechanics, the motivation of why you take exactly this expression, why it's uh, one motivation, the one I, I, find, in, uh, I find interesting and uh, to, to discuss was that one. Okay. Uh, it also leave you freedom okay so why you so there is no reason of course if you take v uh, quadratic you you get a gaussian and this will be a, an, another osterulenbeck process okay so remark um yeah let let me make a remark here which is side remark but maybe help you if If you take a quadratic function, then you just get another uh, Gaussian free field, okay, with a different mass. Okay, try it, okay, prove it, proof for you. Actually, this is an exercise, okay, so let me, let me write it as an exercise, prove that if V equal V squared with some constant, uh, and b is bigger than minus m squared because then you uh, you get problems. Then you we get another Gaussian free field with a different mass. Okay, that's uh, so you have an exercise. Think about it. Okay, so we don't want quadratic V because uh, quadratic V gives us another Gaussian theory. Okay, so we would like to have potential which are not quadratic and any potential would work. Okay, in two dimension, for example, you, in, in one dimension, you can take everything. Okay, because uh, uh, bounded below at least. Okay, but essentially, as soon as it's bounded below, you can take everything. Okay, um, I would not discuss. Uh, okay. Yeah, let me, um, yeah, okay, so what, let me comment a moment the choice of uh, what is a proper choice of V. So any V will, is okay, as soon as works. Okay, so that, that's somehow the, the message in the, in the philosophy of this, uh, this motivation is that, okay, give me any V. And if you can prove something, it's interesting to me. Okay, uh, is okay. Any V, any non-quadratic V. Uh, as, as soon as it, it works, the problem is that not so many choices are available. Okay, in D equal one, one could take any V, any function. Let me take any, any continuous function. Essentially, you can take anything like this, for example, but even more singular. Bounded with some condition. Um, uh, in two dimension, in D equal to uh, one can certainly take a polynomial function. Okay, well, it depends what you want to do, okay, but uh, uh, let, let me say vaguely like this, okay? Because I don't want to enter into all this detail right now, but essentially in two dimension, keep in mind that uh, there are a, a strict, stricter choice. You can take polynomial function, exponential, um, and uh, trigonometric functions. Okay, finite sum of trigonometric functions, okay? In a combination of trigonometric function. Okay. 
and of course the linear combination of all this stuff I think. In d equal 3 we know only about how to take v a, a fourth order polynomial uh, symmetric um, fourth order polynomial. with uh, bounded bill, okay? Okay, Me meaning the highest order coefficient has to be has to be positive. Okay, so that's the reason. So okay, this is the reason we concentrate on five for three, okay? In this case, we say We are looking at five four three. Okay. okay, so I think at this point, uh, at this point, I can even define what is five four three for us. So let, let give a good. I, I don't have a better definition. Okay, that's the only definition I know. If you maybe, but maybe I'm overlooking something. But I think it's the only definition. I know. So the five four three measure. A ah, five four three measure is <clears throat> is any accumulation point of this family okay is any non Gaussian let's say let, let me define in this way okay um, yeah I told you that there were some work. Uh, 543 measure is any non-Gaussian accumulation point of this measure. Um, yeah, let me let me let me put uh, V uh, of a family Uh, uh, epsilon going to zero and um, going to infinity. Um, where one can now you, you have freedom, okay? In this thing, I mean, there is no reason to take a fixed potential for any epsilon m, so the potential where one can take as v any uh, epsilon m dependent fourth order polynomial okay any fourth order polynomial so let me i think that's fine as a definition any fourth order polynomial bounded below you, you need bounded below otherwise the expression you wrote does not make sense uh, bounded below and with epsilon m dependent coefficients. Okay, so I decide I call, uh, so that's define the last, uh, the, the last our final object. Okay, and at this point we are we are in in a situation where we can proceed. Are there any questions? So that, that's. I define the, the measure, okay? So anything you can get out of this family as epsilon? Uh... Uh, yeah, I have one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> it's more of a physicist question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the uh, periodicity of the lattice. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I understand that the, the goal is uh, is to prove uh, existence, but is, is this tries uh, somehow I mean, is this choice gonna gonna make any difference? Um, I mean, for for instance, uniqueness or yeah. I mean, I understand it's very natural, but perhaps um, no, no. I I understand the question. So you you are right. So is is nat is not natural in, in so that also there are some approach they use uh, 
um, they use this, okay? You, you just, you don't approximate the, your space, you approximate only the measure, okay? You just consider interaction in a bounded box, but outside the box, you have a Gaussian free field. Let's zoom out for some technical, uh, it's really a technical issue, which will come on later on, because essentially I don't know yet how to prove uniqueness in this approach, even when the potential is very small. And as soon as you, you cannot prove uniqueness or you, you don't have this kind of control of the infinite volume limit, uh, if you don't have the symmetry at the discrete level, in some way, you don't have it in the continuum. So if I broke the symmetry because I, I, I just gave the potential around zero and then I take the limit, I don't know how to prove Euclidean invariance so of any limit. Uh, uh, let me think, uh, can I, okay, you could imagine, okay, you, you obtain a limit and then you, you take translation, you, you, you take like an ergodic average in space, but it's more difficult and I'm not sure I'm able to do that. Okay, so that's the simplest. Uh, we wanted to have a simple approach. So it, from this point of view, technically that's the easiest way to do. It, it, it has the issue with uniqueness because somehow, uh, uh, you would like to have some boundary condition to enforce uniqueness when you have a, a two-phase region, because essentially this is like an easing model, okay? So if you think about it really on the lattice, this is essentially an easing model uh, with nearest neighbor interaction. Uh, the, the fourth order potential keep just the variable phi compact. But, uh, and so you, you, you expect to have uh, more than one uh, um, more pure uh, phase, okay? So more than one ergodic uh, translation invariant uh, measure in the limit. Okay, so uniqueness of if, if the potential, if you are in the high, uh, low temperature region, let's say. So if the potential is not small enough. Uh, so uh, thank you. Um, yeah. Then uh, just uh, the last bit, um, are there results on uniqueness? Mm. Let, let me say something, yeah. Uh, so the, the, there are a lot of results, okay? This is uh, essentially statistical mechanics is all about this kind of measure. Uh, what I'm saying is that, uh, and actually the quantum field theory is well studied. I didn't, maybe I, I, I need to speak about, uh, okay, that's a good point uh, uh, to make a remark. I put more remarks in the notes, in the extended note in the, in the lecture, uh, didn't want to spend too much time, but somehow both this problem were solved uh, in the in the seventies, okay. So let me uh, let me okay. Uh, an important, if you want, okay, just to keep the, the uh, keep the history right. Uh, the one of the big successes of mathematical constru okay. This is uh, constructive quantum field, Euclidean quantum field theory, like in the 70s and 80s is the construction, is the proof that these limits exist. Uh, so let me, yeah, uh, while you were talking, I, I added, uh, let, let me, I want to call 543 and in on Gaussian, Euclidean invariant and reflection positive accumulation point. This is a weak definition, okay, because I'm only proved I will go on, uh, I will only prove a very weak result of this kind, okay? But actually the limit exists and is unique, okay? In some sense, okay? Or at least it is given by, uh, uh, so let me say, yeah, it is given by a finite dimensional family of models of probability measure. Okay, so you, you have only two parameter, uh, which is the mass and the coupling constant, and somehow uh, you th there is only a finite dimensional. Okay, this is somehow say that the model is super normalizable. Okay, and as you could say, um, and okay, it's unique. Okay, uh, yeah. Okay, that, that's more delicate. Uniqueness is more delicate because you could you could be in the two phase phase lesion and in so and this limit exists um, and it is uh, unique uh, uh, at 
uh, okay, I temperature, which I, I would not explain how it is right now. So the, you, you have many properties, okay? Uh, the, okay, let, let me, I don't want to, to do it. <laughs> so uh, is the proof that the limit exists and has, uh, and has uh, many nice properties. I, I think, uh, for example, uh, yeah, I have many nice properties. And this was the result uh, essentially of, um, yeah, Glim. Uh, 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 <clears throat> uh, it was proven by Glim and Jeffy uh, Feldman Sterwalder Senior Did I, I miss somebody who I miss? Um, Tim Jeffrey Feldman, Sylvander Senior, and uh, somebody know who is who I'm missing. I'm missing a, uh, another person. Yeah, I'm missing uh, another person. I'm sorry. I will add in the lecture. I, I, I didn't. So the, the theorem essentially Glim and Jaffe proved the limit epsilon going to zero in finite volume, and then separately Feldman. I think Ostelwalder and somebody else, and then Feldman and Senior proved independently that the infinite volume limit exists. But somehow the, the theorem depends on all together. And they proved that it's a Euclidean, uh, actually, I, I, I will not be able to prove Euclidean invariant, okay? Uh, they proved the really full Euclidean invariance, reflection positivity, uniqueness from some parameter region, but the proof it's very difficult, okay? So the goal of this lecture, so you, you know many properties, of course, you know also uniqueness. In this lecture, we'll not do uniqueness because I don't know how to do uniqueness in any parameter region yet, even in high temperature with the method I'm trying to explain to you, okay? So the method give uh, uh, existence, give other properties, but not uniqueness. In high temperature, so somehow we we don't we still don't understand very well how this method works, because somehow should be you you expect that in high temperature should be easy to prove uniqueness, but not with the method we are going to uh, we are going to prove to do. Okay, so let me maybe introduce the method. So this is the second part, if you want, of the lectures. And we'll deal uh, about stochastic quantization. Okay, so th this is the only thing I will discuss. So what kind of results you could get out of stochastic quantization and how you get them. Um, yeah, please, if there are other questions. So now if you didn't understood anything so far, it's fine because from now on, I would not use any, oh, may, I, I mean, I, I will use uh, Gaussian free field, I will use this measure, but I will not use any properties I introduced before. So you, if you didn't understood anything because I explained too badly or too fast, just uh, you can just uh, start think, uh, start paying attention from now on, okay? All right, I, I just yeah. wanted to, before we move on, I just sure. wanted to make a, a, a little question about the other way we were trying to build to approximate the measure. Mm -hmm. uh, before via the convolution with smooth functions. Yep. Uh, there was a moment when you said that we kind of lose the reflection positivity or we cannot prove it. But so you, to... you lose it. If you do this way, this measure is not reflection positive anymore. Because you, you, you see in the proof we made, so, because you see the process is not Gaussian anymore, it's not Markovian because somehow this smoothing, so the, the base measure was Markovian in, let's say the first direction, okay? So it's a Markov process in one direction, but then your smoothing somehow looks into the future at any given time, okay? When you have X1 here, this smoothing smooth towards the future. So it's not adapted, this smoothing. It's like when you, 
look at Brownian motion and you smooth both in the past and in the future, you lose the Markov property. So there is no Markov property. And also the other proof of reflection positivity does not work. Because when you do reflection positivity, you want to separate this in some as a product of two things, one which depend only on the past of zero and the other on the future of zero. But you see the, the, the potential mixes what happens around zero here. So you, it's not clear. Remember that this, this is a convolution, okay? So this means really, let me maybe write it down explicitly. Okay, this is still formal at this level, but it was something like this, okay? You, you look at the point X, you look in a small neighborhood to compute these things. So this is not adapted. So this cannot be split into parts. So if uh, even if this X is as one coordinate positive, then inside you have something which depends on the negative coordinates. Yeah, just try to write it down. Maybe it's easier to understand. Is this okay? So this is on on all the coordinates, okay? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, why? What I'm saying here is that you you could do the same, but just move d minus one coordinates and one keep one really the same. So this is what I'm saying here. It is you you don't smooth all the, the coordinates of the process. So the process is not a function. You cannot compute in a given point, but somehow you can fix one of the coordinates and just uh, uh, take a convolution in the other coordinates, and that would keep. Now, the int, since one of the coordinates, uh, this would be fine. Uh, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think there is no point of writing. Maybe if you are interested, uh, let, let ask more insistently. I will write it down. But I think it's not. Uh, uh, that could be a way to keep reflection positivity in one direction. And actually, also Markovianity. Okay. So there, there are other strategies. Uh, I just wanted to point out. So I listed like three strategies of regularizing the problem and each of them has some defect and some advantage. Okay, so somehow the point is there, there are no exist an easy, cheap way out of the problem. Okay, so now you have to regularize. As soon as you regularize, you lose your symmetries. So you try to lose as, as, as few as possible of these symmetries. And somehow this is the one which we found easier to work with, but there is nothing uh, special about this. Okay, so now I like also because it's very elementary. Okay, now your problem, I can state uh, undergraduates. Okay, there is nothing. It's a finite dimensional Gaussian. So like what I'm going to do today, it's really study this finite dimensional measure and introduce tool to take, for example, even just one limit. Okay, like M going to infinity. And you start to think about the problem that's non trivial already. Okay, you, how you take the limit m going to infinity, how you prove that this family of measure exists in the limit. Uh, that's, uh, that's the problem of statistical mechanics. Okay, the infinite volume limit in a system of unbounded spin, if you want to. Okay, so let me maybe. Uh, uh, so, for, so for epsilon fixed. And m to infinity. This is a problem of statistical mechanics. Okay, the infinite volume limit of a system of unbounded spins with a nearest neighbor. Interaction. If you know what does it mean? If you don't know, it's it's the it's this measure. Okay, this is it's a part. It's one a measure of, of a larger class which has this property that is uh, you, you have unbounded variable in every position. So this variable in every position it, they could be as large as you want, with maybe small probability but very large anyway. And then nearest neighbor interaction because if you write it down exactly what is this Gaussian measure, you see that the Laplacian couples only nearest neighbor, okay? So somehow this measure, uh, the distribution at any given point conditionally on all the other depend only on, on, the, on a finite neighbor, actually order one neighbor. Anyway, okay, don't want to insist too much. Just if you know this notion, maybe you can link yourself. So we will study this limit today, I, I hope. Okay, so stochastic quantization. 
Okay. Um, let me. Okay, so now the problem is elementary. Okay, so I want to study these measures. Um, and what is stochastic quantization? So, uh, as I told you, so as I said at the beginning, uh, a stochastic quantization of a given measure rho is a map f of rho which send a Gaussian process to a random variable a Gaussian if you want I I don't need uh, in general there, there is no time in the Gaussian random variable to a random variable with low rho. okay so this is what the general uh, in this lecture. Okay, this is the kind of, this is what I like to think about stochastic quantization. There is no formal definition in the literature, so I can give mine, okay, in this lecture. Uh, okay, which is consistent with what, what you understand as stochastic quantization. Uh, so we want to find one. Um, we want to find a stochastic quantization. Let let me, um, yeah, th there are various ways to do it. Um, and the, maybe I want just, uh, the, even, even in our case, there are many of such stochastic quantization. Many interesting ways, okay? To do this, and I can I know at least uh, one, two, three, four, five men. Okay, so I, I list them. Can you hear me? Is okay, or the, the noise does uh, cause a problem for you? No, it's okay. No, it's no, okay. It's we can okay. hear you. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. Thanks. So there, there are four. So this is. Um, Okay, actually, for this, uh, yeah, in this case, I, I know only three. <laughs> I, I cannot write the four because I discretize one of the time directions. So let let me um, now work in the case case nu epsilon m. So let me just concentrate in our. There are many interesting ways to do this. Okay, so the first one is Langevin dynamics. or what is called parabolic. This is what we are going to do, okay? Parabolic stochastic quantization. Okay, and this refer to consider the dynamics. Uh, um, so the map, so the map F of new is given, okay? The process, the Gaussian process W is a space time white noise. And the map F or nu is given by uh, the solution X, mm, the solution phi. Yeah, I don't know how to write it. So we'll see now notation of the um, family of the uh, SD. Um, yeah, okay, let me, the, uh, it's not a space time, what no, so the Gaussian process is a family of Brownian functions, and the map uh, F is given by the solution. I, I will discuss a lot about this, so you don't have to, you don't have to understand everything, okay, just maybe get the big picture right now. So this is this is the solution of this equation, formally at least. Um, v prime t of t dt. So this is everything dt. dt. 
I should read. Okay, just uh, wrote uh, something. Okay, so this will be what we are going, uh, what we are going to look in the detail. Okay, but and I will prove to you that my this statement is correct. Okay, so you you take. Okay, so you give me a bunch of Brownian motion, they depend on space. So you, you have to imagine that here everything depends on space. Okay, and this is uh, okay, the Laplacian in X, and this is in X with V prime of something is just the derivative, the derivative, V prime, the derivative. Okay, V is a function. Um, so this will be the first approach, okay? The first approach will be, I construct this map by solving this uh, family of all the SDEs, huh? okay? This is a finite dimensional system of SDEs. And uh, this is like really the discrete Laplacian. So let me write like this. So there is no problem, okay? That's uh, like a linear. This is an SD with, uh, okay, maybe we will discuss the problem in defining, but okay, it uh, seems easy. But that's not the only approach possible. And there, is, there are at least uh, two other approach. They are of elliptic stochastic quantization. Let me just write elliptic stochastic quantization. And uh, um, so the Gaussian process, okay, now let me Okay, now the Gaussian process is more complicated. So let me, uh, so phi, so phi, uh, so yeah, okay, this depend on an additional, yeah, let, let me be precise. So is the stationary solution at time, the stationary solution phi at time zero? Sorry, uh, let me write, let be precise because in this way you construct a process which depend on this additional parameter, which is a new time. So this is the the map is uh, is given by the stationary solution uh, f of omega. You call it uh, so rho. Okay, no f of omega is given really by phi of zero, and phi is the stationary solution of the SD, okay? Here, T is an additional fixtures. It is not the Euclidean term, okay? So that's uh, that's important, otherwise you get confused, okay? From, from now on, I will use T only for this uh, additional time, okay? The, the Euclidean time is inside this uh, family of uh, parameters, okay? This is ranging, remember, this was ranging in L epsilon, M maybe, and T is just a real number, okay? So the, the, we discretize the Euclidean time also, so, and the Euclidean time is inside uh, this object, okay? So elliptic stochastic quantization is phi now is, um, uh, so you have, uh, sorry, this is new. So you have this, a similar situation, but now phi is a map from R2. So here, here was a map from R to lambda epsilon M, so in R, okay? So this was uh, our uh, things here. So here it goes from R2 actually. So you don't need a time, okay, to do stochastic quantization. This is the point I, I want to make at this point. Uh, but now is the solution to the elliptic PD. So now you have a, an elliptic PD. Uh, this is more technically a bit more involved, but uh, somehow the idea is that you, you, you have a Laplacian in this R2, then you have the Laplacian on the tongue in this space, okay. Uh, then you have the mass, then you have these two Laplacians, which are negative. 
then you have this field. So everything is applied to the field X and you hit has now two coordinates that are an X. Uh, and otherwise you have the same structure. So let me see, uh, did I got it? I think I got it wrong. Here you have plus and minus, sorry. And uh, here I want to write in this way. Ah, sorry, now it depends uh, what convention I use for V. Okay, I have a minus here. Now I, got, I um, um, always get lost. So I think, yeah, I think it's okay. This should be V prime. Yeah, if you if you see that there is a problem, let me know. Yeah. Um, the, the, this is the same V prime, but the question is different. And here now it's more complicated because you have uh, uh, you have space time. Okay, you you have a white noise somewhere and here. Where see um, is a space time what noise? So meaning it's a Gaussian process independent in every point of of this index set. Okay, and here you understand very well because it's discrete. Here it's more complicated, but uh, um, but. Uh, Yeah, it's more complicated, but somehow it's similar. Okay. And I want to take this C as a, okay, let's call it W here in this approach. So, okay. Uh, I don't want to call it W because we call, we call and just, um, yeah, call it Psi. So, this is a map from this process, which is okay still. And you look at, uh, this is uh, this is the projection in the first component. Okay. Uh, so let me write uh, let me write in this way to be clear that this is the projection in the first component. So this is okay. So you project in the first component. So you project away the first component. Uh, like here, here you take a time zero. Here you take two, ten. Okay, but you see structure is the same. And then I know a third approach, which, uh, okay, actually I know other two approaches. So there is canonical stochastic quantization. Okay, there is a question in the chat. Ah, okay, no, it's okay, Grotto, help me. Um, canonical stochastic quantization is, uh, you, you take a, so, let me think, I think I can use this notation. So um, the Gaussian uh, the Gaussian process family of prune motion and the map uh, and the map is given by the stationary solution. Uh, let me say there are many, okay. The stationary solution of the SD. Okay, the stationary of the hyperbolic. Okay, let me write in this way. Um, so the SD now is different. And it looks like this. So I have to write, okay, maybe I have to write in this way to make parallel with that. Uh, let me, let me think a moment. I think here it's okay. So here then I want to add the derivative in time of the Brunian motion, which does not exist, but I have too many parentheses around. Why I have? I'm not sure why I put all these parentheses. Okay, here I put because I wanted to make the difference. Yeah, I think it's fine. Let me remove. Ah, here because I wanted to have. Uh, so let me just write it this way. Um, I think it's okay. So it's a you you see of the hyperbolic. 
So this is of the wave equation. So this is of wave equation. Okay, you it's discrete space, but essentially discrete if you want to wave, wave equation. Did it I got it got it right? Maybe you can add uh, I think you, you have to add a parameter. One has to add a parameter. Uh, I think now it's okay, something like this. Okay, I don't. Uh, uh, okay, let, let me just approximate the reacting. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'm not sure about all the sign, but uh, that's, that's the idea. Um, Okay, so here you have three different ways, actually, which correspond nicely to three different kinds of PDs, okay? You can do with parabolic equations, okay? You, you see derivative in time and Laplacian you have here. You, you have an elliptic equation, so here there is no time, and you have only Laplacians. Of course, they are discrete, okay, here there is a continuum Laplacian, discrete Laplacian. Or you can have uh, still time, but uh, somehow now the, the, the relation, the highest order operator are second time derivative and Laplacian. So this is an hyperbolic equation. You see when you put the Laplacian on the other side, you get the, the minus sign. Has nothing to do with Minkowski space, okay? But still you can represent. So all these equations, I think in this context, what can even prove, huh? but somehow they, they are at least expected to be related to that measure in the sense I, I I wrote here. And then there is another approach, which is, I know, which is variational. Which I would not explain. Okay, so uh, see, uh, so there is a paper, uh, wrote a paper. Okay. Uh, just to mention that I, I know at least four ways to do this. And actually I know a fifth, but uh, I need a different approximation, okay? Um, okay, there is even another possible approach uh, which require to consider an evolution in the um, Euclidean time stochastic evolution in the Euclidean time. Okay, so this we, uh, uh, and looks like, um, so th this is still another approach. Uh, looks more, uh, though I don't, I don't want to write it maybe in full detail, but just to give you an idea, does it look like? It's similar to that, but you, you now, you, you now evolve in the Euclidean time. Okay, so you need the Euclidean time to be, um, to be not discrete. Okay, otherwise I cannot give a meaning really to that. And, uh, and you have a noise which depends only on the Euclidean time. So you, you have something like this. Something like this. So there is no time, there is only the Euclidean time. There is only the Euclidean and X takes value now, but you, you need to take the Euclidean space. Uh, uh, okay, let me write this epsilon M at D minus one, for example. Okay, in this case, you cannot take discretize Euclidean time. And also the measure no epsilon M has to be taken slightly differently. Okay, so that, that's just uh, just to say. Okay, so there, there are these five, uh, let me maybe take a smaller, uh, there, there is this five method, ah, sorry, here, no, it does not work like this. We have seen, okay, remember what was the evolution of the Gaussian free feed, so let me actually, I don't need the variable X anymore somehow because everything it's uh, uh, computed at the same point. Uh, so remember that uh, I, we saw the evolution of, now this is negative, so let me write in this way. 
definitely need a minus then front, yeah. Okay, so now this looks like that. Okay, and uh, I think if I didn't make Yeah, sorry. Now I'm not really sure. There, there should be an operator here. Maybe we don't. Now I don't. Uh, I'm not really sure. No, I think it's should be okay. Should be okay. It's this is really different. Okay, so you you keep the Euclidean time continuous, and then you evolve in the Euclidean time. This is like the Markovian. This is essentially the Markovian point of view with respect to the uh, Euclidean quantum field theory. Okay, so the Euclidean quantum field theory, we, we said is just a Markov process in infinite dimension. That was the content of the first part of the course. And you can use, perturb this Markov process as we have seen, uh, where we perturb the, you or you process okay so this is the linear part is the process with a drift uh yeah um, with a drift minus v okay if you want you you take a osteolimbic process and you perturb with a drift okay if it's too vague don't don't forget okay <laughs> Maybe it's to somebody can help uh, intuition to see that there are many different ways you can do in the Euclidean time. So just work in, in the dimension, use one of the dimension of the Euclidean time, which you keep continuous and then try to, to find a, a stationary evolution that should be, should give you a reflection positive measure, uh, Euclidean quantum field theory. Or you have these three approaches, okay? You just discretize everything. So you have a discrete uh, model and then you introduce additional parameters and you can do it in many ways, at least four I know. You can introduce a parabolic time, parabolic dynamics and elliptic dynamics. Then you don't even have time. You have just two, so, sorry, there is no elliptic dynamic. There is an equation. Um, or a canonical stochastic quantization. This means to introduce, it's called canonical because essentially you have to introduce the canonical, the derivative, this time derivative is the canonical variable to the field. Okay, so this involve, uh, an, a, a, this is an Hamiltonian, uh, okay, this is an Hamiltonian equation. Without noise, this is an Hamiltonian equation, okay? If you remove the noise, this is an Hamiltonian evolution, okay? Okay, there are all these methods. Uh, the one we are going to look at is Langevin dynamics. Uh, why? Well, because uh, uh, I think the only other one which is useful as far that which is easy to use is this variational method, but I would not discuss it here. And all the other methods are more difficult to use. Uh, elliptic equations are more difficult than parabolic, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, for me, quite difficult to treat them. Um, and uh, okay, for elliptic equation, we have a problem actually. You 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 can prove something about it, but uh, um, but you yeah it's difficult to prove really that the measure new it's the it's this value okay you you need to be careful and sometimes it's not easy to prove it um i think actually even maybe in this case i could use even the parabolic elliptic yeah okay anyway uh i will not discuss the deep. let's say let's use this one okay let's fix to this one uh maybe the elliptic could be used but uh, I don't have the proof and the course in the course I will use the Langevin dynamics. Uh, yeah, I think it's time uh, it's time to, to go. Um, so I, I think I, uh, I started this new part. Uh, so let, let's wrap up the discussion this morning of this morning. So um, we finally, 
wrote down a precise problem which we want to solve. Okay, you see we are not um, we are not very demanding. Okay, so you you just write down this kind of approximation or whatever, and then you try. So the goal for us will be how we take these limits. And they are, they are both difficult. Even the m infinity limit is difficult because somehow this quantity is going to infinity. So you really want to take you you cannot take the limit of the density. You need really to look at the measure weekly and locally. Okay, in the topology given by testing, uh, looking at the measure with function of the random variable, which only looks at the random variable in a bounded region. And, and then converge, weak convergence is, is defined as the convergence uh, against all these functions. Um, okay, so that, that's the goal. And then we said, okay, what are the methods we want to use? I, I made a remark that many things are known. Okay, so uh, with respect to the question I was asked, uh, you know, a lot, I mean, all, a lot of results in statistical mechanics and a lot of results in uh, quantum field theory are known about uh, the, the, the behavior of this method. Okay, so the interest in this lecture is to present to you a new method, which is uh, uh, which with which you cannot still I get all these results, but I hope that at some point you will get some of the interesting result. At least we can prove the existence of the measure. And uh, if you know a bit uh, the literature, it's a difficult result, okay? It's not trivial even to prove existence. And uh, um, so I, I think my wish in this lecture was really to present a complete proof of existence. And the only method which I, I, I am able to use because it is the only one I know well enough is, is this one. Uh, is the method I'm going to present that is stochastic quantization. And then I presented you several stochastic quantizations. Okay, in the, in the, in the sense I, I tried to give at the beginning. Okay, so this map which send your Gaussian into my new object. You see, this is not, a, okay, let, let me make, let me make this remark, which is interesting. Okay, this is a representation of a measure as a perturbation of a Gaussian. Okay, so you write your measure as, okay, I have my Gaussian and I put a density on the Gaussian and I have a new measure, which is non-Gaussian. And that's somehow all the literature is, is uh, developed from this point of view, okay? From the point of view of having a perturbation of a measure via density. While what we want to do is that not use that point of view, but use another point of view. That is, I don't want to see my measure as something having a density with respect to a Gaussian, but I want to see my measure as the push forward of another measure, which is Gaussian, because Gaussian are nice to work with, but somehow not at a density, okay? So maybe let me make this point at the end. So remark, this is maybe important point. Uh, while the measure new is described, defined, okay. So I, th I think conceptually that's an important point I want to make is defined as uh, uh, via a density with respect to a Gaussian, the goal of Stochastic quantization is to define it as a push forward of a Gaussian measure. So you, you have like phi mu, the push forward of a Gaussian measure. And you, 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 maybe you, so one difference to appreciate is that it's easier to control. So, I mean, you could have a, you could have measure which are not absolutely continuous, but which you can describe as one as push forward or the other, okay? So in, it seems that in infinite dimensions, so now it's easier to, to do this push forward than to control the density or to use the density to control the measure. 
in, in some situations, okay? So there is this difference, but think in infinite dimension, it seems that push forward are more robust, okay? Uh, example, okay, if, uh, but this is an, a trivial example, okay? Example, uh, if X uh, is, a, is a Gaussian in infinite dimension, then maybe, okay, let, let me give you a, a very, a trivial example, okay? Let, uh, let me, okay, example. Sorry, I, I, I was thinking to a more complicated one. I need an infinite dimensional case, otherwise you don't see, but example, um, let be a one dimensional Brunier motion. Uh, dimensional Brunier motion. Then, um, and let, okay. Xt, so now you take the Brunian motion. And you, you add a drift, okay? Okay, then, um, then the claim is that then while there is no problem to see the law of X as push forward of that of B, the density, uh, the, they are absolute, they are not absolutely continuous, okay? Okay, so just to give this example, okay, so you, you can construct very easily one measure which is push forward or another without they being absolutely continuous, okay? And that what will happen is that somehow in the limit, the measure is not anymore. So let me go back in our example. So in the limit, what will happen is that th this measure cannot be described very effective, very easily as a perturbation of a Gaussian measure. While we can very, okay, we can, control the push forward. Okay, let me not, I mean, use uh, too many adjectives. Okay, I think uh, this is the technical interest. Okay, so why stochastic quant Because it lo looks more complicated, okay? So why, so th this measure, it's elementary. If you want already to, this measure, it's elementary. It's a finite dimensional Gaussian. And already to define the stochastic quantization, like in the, with the Langevin dynamics, I will have to prove something this afternoon. It's not clear that uh, first of all, this SD can be solved because time uh, can be very large. It's not clear that, uh, um, it's not clear that even if you solve it, that the solution is this low, okay? That's both things are not clear. We will do this this afternoon and maybe we try to, in this afternoon we, we managed, I hope we will manage to prove the infinite volume limit using this approach. And uh, that somehow give you already a sense why technically it seems that stochastic quantization is convenient, okay? And I tried myself to, exp it was surprising to myself too when I started to think about this kind of problem. And, and somehow one of the kind of motivation reasons, intuitive reasons is this observation that push forward are less sensible to questions of absolute continuity. Okay, so it's not important if two measures are absolutely continuous. That's not what matters for the push forward. Okay, this, this map it's very easy. Okay, I can I know everything about X from knowing properties of B and just knowing this map. Okay, while if you try to approximate the law of X with the law of B in the sense of density, then you you cannot. Okay, they are not absolutely continuous. Okay, so exercise for you, prove it. As exercise prove it. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. I finished. Sorry, uh, I stop here.